Good evening and welcome to the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. I am Steve Sakala. I am an assistant professor at the Harris School of Public Policy, uh, at least for the first next eight months. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, seminar series event of the year. Uh, for those of you who are new to UChicago, EPIC is an interdisciplinary center committed to producing research to solve what we call the Global Energy Challenge which is how to provide sufficient affordable energy to, human, to power human development without causing air pollution that damages human health or emitting carbon dioxide that causes climate change. For research to make a difference in the real world, however, it needs to get out of the academy and into the hands of people who can use it to make a difference, not just policymakers, but citizens and voters like everyone here tonight. As part of that mission, EPIC invites leading academics uh, lawmakers, industry leaders, and here tonight, journalists, to invite uh, to Chicago to share their insights from their work with the larger EPIC community. Tonight, we're excited to have Russell Gold, an investigative journalist and author most recently of Superpower, One Man's Quest to Transform American Energy. The book illustrates both the promise uh, of renewable energy in the United States and the deep challenges of integrating it into the grid as told through the story of a single ambitious developer. Now, historically, for the past 100 or so years, uh, the way that electricity has been delivered to people, or the fuel for electricity uh, has been delivered to people, has been taking it out of the ground in the form of fossil fuels, usually putting it on a rail car or in a pipeline, shipping it closer to population centers where it was converted, burned, converted into energy, and then finally delivered to, to people's houses. For the transformation towards a more renewable grid, things are gonna have to change a little bit because while, again, the energy tends to be far from population sources, say uh, the coal-fired power here in Chicago comes from Wyoming, which is far, um, Renewable energy is going to come from either the southwest, where it's very uh, solar intensive, or the wind quarter through the middle of the country, and it's going to have to make it to population centers. But we can't put those resources on a rail car, and we can't put them on a pipeline. They're going to have to go on transmission lines. The only way to transform to a renewable grid is to build more transmission, and that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. Russell has been a reporter for the Wall Street Journal since 2000 after early career stints at the Philadelphia Inquirer and San Antonio Express News. At the Journal, he was a leading member of the team that covered the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill, contributing to work that was a Pulitzer finalist for national reporting. In addition to, sup uh, to superpower, he's also the author of The Boom, perhaps the most authoritative authoritative account written for a general audience on the transformative economic effects of the U.S. fracking boom. Uh, our director, the Milton Friedman Professor of Economics at the, in the Economics Department and also at the Harris School of Public Policy, uh, Michael Greenstone, will interview Russell for 40 minutes or so and then we'll have a question and answer uh, afterwards. Please join me in welcoming Russell and Michael. What's up with the titles? With the titles? Boom, superpower, who does that? Is that you? Uh, you know, uh, DC Comics, actually. Uh, we're, trying, we're trying to get into the slipstream of uh, the, the Marvel and DC Comics. Um, you know, the superpower was a difficult title to come up with. We weren't sure what to, hmm. to, what to call this book. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, this was, superpower is an idea that's been around for about 100 years. And when we heard about it, I was like, oh, okay, this, this, this works. This works. Uh, my children might accidentally pick up this book. That's, that's the hope. That's the hope, you know. <laughs> we, almo we almost had the, the main person in the book, uh, Michael Skelly, you know, maybe emerging with yeah. a big S on his face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now that we've established that you can write good titles. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of students here today, uh, all of whom, in one way or another, are trying to figure out what to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, as am I, I'm still working on it. Well, well, actually, oh, well then you're undermining my question. Uh, uh, who are you, <laughs> where did you come from, and uh -huh. why in the world did you become an energy reporter? <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I came from a place with actually very little energy. Um, I came from Philadelphia where we don't really have much wind, we don't have much solar, we don't mine coal anywhere close to that, or oil or gas, so I, I I sort of stumbled in this. I, you know, I made it to Texas 
uh, in the 1990s as a reporter. And uh, you know, I always say that I ended up covering energy as a love story because I met somebody and we ended up getting married and we decided we wanted to settle in Texas. And I looked around and so I said, what's interesting to cover in Texas? Oh yeah, the, the energy industry. That was, it was either that or Walmart and, and energy industry just seemed a lot more interesting to me. So I, right about 2000, 2001, I just started, uh, 2002, started covering energy. I remember uh, when I was trying to decide what to do with my life, it was very hard to, uh, closing doors? What was a door that you closed that you had the hardest time closing? Um, well, I, I actually thought I was gonna be an academic for a long time. <laughs> Uh, that was yeah, that was the plan, and uh, uh, I, you know, I, I pretty much until I was a senior in college, I, I thought I was going to pursue a master's and a PhD in history. And then one day, I just I, I came back and I said, you know, I just I, libraries they're not. Uh, I, I just I'm not enjoying my time in them anymore. I wanted to get out into the world a little bit more, so I ended up being a journalist. Excellent. I'm going to have a history question for you in a minute. But, okay. Uh, so hydraulic fracturing and then wind, like was this, are you trying to curry favor with your environmental friends? I or? was, yeah. <laughs> no, you know, frankly. And like how popular did you become with your environmental friends oh, after both? I've, I've been, I've, yeah, both sides, you distrust me at this point. Um, yeah, fracking, I sort of stumbled upon fracking because in 2002, when you're the low person on the energy reporting totem pole yeah. at the Wall Street Journal, you don't get assigned Exxon you get assigned these small companies that frankly at the time nobody really cared about. Um, not Wall Street, not Devon, Chesapeake. I mean, at the time these were companies that barely had any market value. And I was living in Dallas at the time and by coincidence these companies were starting in Fort Worth in the Barnett Shell just outside of Fort Worth to figure out what a hydraulic fracturing job was and all of a sudden, hey, we've got a lot of natural gas. So I. I sort of stumbled upon that really, you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than to be good yeah. or to have foresight. Um, and so I, I covered that as a, as a journalist for a while. I wrote a book about it. And then I was looking around sort of thinking, what's the next big thing? You know, we've done natural gas. What's, what's really changing everything? Hmm. And, and the answer was very obvious. It was renewables. I mean, hmm. they were, you know, even when I started working on this, this book a few years ago, um, it was obvious that they were starting to have a pretty profound effect. And it's only accelerated since then. Excellent. Um, so why don't we dive into the book a little bit? Uh, and so maybe not everyone is exactly uh, as familiar as Steve is with the way the grid works. Uh, you want to give a little tutorial on why <laughs> transmission normally like a topic that drives people out of parties and, uh, so seemed like a good idea. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. So. And just even just a primer on how does it work? Oh, absolutely. A hundred yeah, yeah. years ago, there really was no big transmission grid. Yeah. You burn coal, you generated power, more or less where the power was going to be used. So I actually have this in the book. Downtown Chicago, they used to have um, these coal burning uh, dynamos uh, at, the bottom of the at the bottom of the buildings. And the smoke and the pollution got so bad that they would talk about Chicago filling up with smoke. And there was a group called the, I love this, it was called the Society for the Prevention of Smoke <laughs> that was developed here in Chicago to try to get these dynamos, try to get the smoke out. So what happened was, people realized, well, wait a second. We can carry electricity across these AC lines, these transmission lines, um, and so we can move the power outside of cities and bring through transmission lines the power inside the cities. Smoking problem resolved. Um, and then people, you know, so at the, as, as, and this is right after Thomas Edison, 1910s, 1920s, thought, well, we can't really move it that far. We'll lose too much power. And lo and behold, technology continues to advance, and you can start moving it 50 miles, 100 miles, 200 miles. So you have these development of these regional power grids uh, across the United States. Uh, and the, the companies that were developed, Houston Power and Light, um, you know, Indianapolis, this. Uh, so it would give the sense yeah. you would have these regional power grids. Uh, and then all of a sudden, and this is where the title superpower comes from, there's this guy uh, who comes up with this idea like, well, what if we could connect all these regional power grids together and build one massive power grid? Um, 
And uh, you know, his idea didn't quite, this was 1920s, 1930s, his idea didn't quite go as far as, as he wanted to, but we sort of started doing that. We connected the grids. Alabama power could share power with Atlanta, which would share power with North Carolina. Things got more efficient. The power grid got bigger. We could build bigger coal plants. We could build bigger hydro dams. Um, power costs kept coming down. And so that's how we developed this, this power grid in the United States. We actually have three power grids in the United States, the East, the West, and Texas. You know, I'm, I live in Texas, so I, I can sort of brag about that. <laughs> um, but these power grids, while great at certain things, the one area where they really fall down, and continue to this day, um, is moving large amounts of power between regions. So if you have a great resource in one part of the country, moving it to another part of the country, it's just not really built for that. And, and there are a lot of political reasons, there are a lot of, it's not a technological reason why you couldn't How do much it. do we lose per 100 miles? <sighs> See, now you're, 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 you're thinking that I'm more of a technical person <laughs> than I am. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. I'm, Steve, I, can Steve I pass? had an answer, yeah. Very small, there you go. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, um, smart audience, smarter than uh, the people. <laughs> and uh, how do renewables and wind, are they particularly special? Well, they're special in one way in that they don't generate, um, oh, they're special in a number of ways. They don't generate uh, carbon dioxide. They don't generate greenhouse gases. So they sort of solve one of the issues that we face, which is that, uh, most of our electricity and energy production right now is generating greenhouse gases which are accumulating and causing climate change. So they're special in that way. They're special in another way which is that they used to be really expensive and nowadays they're, they've rapidly become the lowest cost way to generate electricity um, in the United States, in most parts of the United States. Now, that doesn't include moving the power everywhere it needs to be, but in a particular place, uh, Wind, in, in most counties, wind and solar has become the cheapest, pla uh, cheapest way to generate uh, a kilowatt or megawatt of electricity, which is sort of amazing. Ten years ago, that would have been ridiculous to say. But it's true. Okay, and so now enters the superhero <laughs> of the book, uh, Michael Skelly. So do you want to tell us about him? Yeah, He's sure. He's kind of a... You have a, you have a gift for, in your other book as well for finding like, <laughs> people that people can relate to. Or so at least are intrigued by. He is, he is this interesting character who uh, graduates from college, goes, to, um, uh, goes down to Costa Rica to work at the Peace Corps, comes back, decides that he needs to learn something about how money works in this world, and goes to Harvard Business School. And when he's coming out of Harvard Business School, decides he wants to be the person in his graduating class who has the most interesting job and never has to wear a tie. Uh, and so he ends up getting, so, so he ends up going back down to Costa Rica to build the first, uh, um, the, the, the first tourist attraction that will take you up into the rainforest on like a basically, what's basically a ski lift. Uh, and in doing that, encounters all sorts of challenges. How do I bring in, uh, how do I build this? How do I work with the local officials? And realizes he really likes develop, developing big projects. And so from there he ends up. Wait, no, hold on, you gotta tell about the helicopter. Right? Oh, yeah. So, so he was working, so the, the idea came from a scientist who had built uh, to study what was going on in the canopy of the rainforest, had built a way to get up there. And he kept getting visitors who came down and said, you know, we want to see what it's like in the canopy. So he's like, fine, I'm going to build something so everyone can do it and you can stop bothering me and I can go back to my research. Yeah. But he was really a, an environmentalist. So he, he tells Skelly, you have to build this, but don't knock down any trees. So the idea, you know, he couldn't clear cut his way in. And he didn't know how to get the, these, these, you know, these giant poles in that would hold it aloft. And he looks around and realizes the only, his only solution is to get a helicopter, but there were no heavy lift helicopters anywhere nearby. So when he was at Harvard, he had actually become friendly with a couple former Sandinistas in Nicaragua who were studying a public policy. So he goes up to uh, Managua to the, air, the airport and, and encounters or, or runs into one of them again and ends up cutting a deal to rent a helicopter from the San, well, it was, it was still technically, it was the, it was the Sandinistas, Violeta Chamorro had taken over, so it wasn't the Sandinistas anymore, but it was still 
technically the Air Force was called the Sandinista Air Force. And he rents it, they have to unbolt the machine guns because otherwise he would have started a Central American war by importing, invading, uh, invading yeah, Costa Rica. Rica. Yeah. Um, and so and, and it was, he basically had to camp, and talk about persistence. And this is sometimes what you need to get something done. He had sort of done a handshake deal, but then the Air Force was just being flaky. He ended up having to camp himself in someone's office, a general's office, for a week until finally he said, you know, just to get rid of you, I will rent you the helicopter. And they, you know, they, they worked fine. They, they were able to bring from, you know, the, these, these poles, these giant, you know, 100, 200 feet long poles have been sitting in a port and he was able to get it into the rainforest and you can still use, you can still go and visit the canopy. It's still working to this day. But he gets into this, he, he, he finds that he really likes the challenge uh, and the freedom of doing developing. So he starts building wind farms. Uh, he comes back to the United States, he gets connected with this fascinating family uh, in Houston called the Zilka family, uh, who had been big oil and gas. I mean, I guess maybe like me, they'd been big into oil and gas, and they're like, you know, maybe we want to try renewables next, um, after they sold their company. And uh, he starts building wind farms. And, and this is like 2000, 2001, 2002. Starts off with small 20 megawatt, 30, 50. Um, by the time 2006, seven rolls around, Second or third largest wind farm developer in the United States. Pretty big wind farms at that point, 200, 300 megawatts, very ambitious. And uh, they end up selling the company to Goldman Sachs. So I guess he learned something right at uh, um, Harvard Business School. Uh, very successful. And then he sort of s uh, says to himself, so he, he was only the developer. So he didn't make, you know, he made some money, but didn't make as much money as the Zilka family off that deal. Because they ended up selling the, the, the company for like a billion dollars. Um, and he sort of looks around and sort of says, you know, what do I want to do with my life? I've been successful at this. I've made some money. Um, and he realized that 200, 300 megawatt wind farms were great, but it really wasn't, it really wasn't changing uh, the bigger picture. It wasn't big enough. Uh, it wasn't s uh, the kind of scale he needed to. And he looked around and he realized the big well, challenge. Did he care about just uh, he wanted to make money, or did he have broader concerns? Uh, it, there was a little climate change yeah. interest in him. I, it was, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't. We, a we huge don't mind making money as Mercer. No, no, he was, <laughs> but you know, he's, he sort of, he wanted. It was more challenge than anything else. Yeah, yeah he wanted to make some money. Um, yes, he wanted to do something about climate change. But I think what really drove him more than anything else was he wanted to identify a really difficult challenge, <laughs> and overcome it. I mean, that's sort of what he was doing in the Costa Rica rainforest. What's the challenge? How do you build? you know, a ski lift in the middle of a rainforest without knocking down any trees. That's, that's a tough challenge. Um, so the challenge he, he realized was that, uh, there's a great quote that says, if you like renewables, you need to love transmission, um, it, which is true. If we're going to build a lot of renewables in this country, we need to really change our transmission grid. And so he decided what he wanted to see if we could do was to build a giant extension cord, really, 700 miles. Uh, to bring renewable wind power from the middle of the country, the Great Plains, where it's just phenomenal wind resource, uh, into across the Mississippi River into Tennessee. And so he created a company, he got backing, and he set off to do it. He you know, financed personally the first couple million dollars and then got, uh, got some good backers and uh, uh, went off to, to see if he could build a large transmission line. Okay, so I'm gonna, I want to come back to him in one minute, but yeah. there, I just want to take a little off-ramp here for sure. a second. Uh, now, uh, every academic thinks they're going to wake up every morning, certainly myself included, and like have a great idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be great if we had a great idea every day. From your books, uh, I have the sense that you might, I have a friend of mine who works in Silicon Valley who says ideas are a dime a dozen, <laughs> Execution eats ideas lunch every <laughs> single day. Yeah, is that true? Are we aren't we supposed aren't ideas the solution to everything? Uh, you know, last time I checked, ideas didn't build the infrastructure we need, uh, and we're going to need um, to 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 really make a dent in in what's facing the world right now, which is this big challenge of, of climate change, providing the energy mm -hmm. we need without um, raising the temperature. Um, and so, no, I don't, you know, we have plenty of ideas. We know how to do a lot of this. Um, we just, you know, actually doing it is the problem. Actually mm -hmm. building something. We, we've kind of gotten off track in this country. We used to build things. We, we're not so great at that anymore. 
Hmm. I'm going to come back to that. All right. uh, but I, I can't resist. You do, you're reminding me, and since you're from Texas, I can do it. <laughs> Uh, when Ross Perot was running for president, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> he was in a debate and he was getting, kind of getting cornered about, uh, you know, what is your plan about this, that, this? And, you know, of course, he didn't know anything about any, in, any public policy issue. He goes, plan? Plan? We don't need, there's plans all over the place. We need someone to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your view. Yeah. yeah well, it's, it's, you need a good idea, yeah. but, uh, you know, look. Here's where I come down on this. When I, when I set out to write this book, there were several good books then and, and now about climate change. And you know, they all had words like extinction, unlivable, um, you know, doom and gloom, just these things are just going really badly. And I wanted to write about somebody who tried to make a difference, you know, who, whether he was successful or not, whether it was the best idea, actually went out and tried to do something because I, I, I wanted to highlight that that was, you know, I, I guess I found that admirable. Okay. Not just talking about it, not just tweeting about it. He doesn't tweet. No. Uh, let's go out and try to make something happen. And I tweet, so I mean, I okay. guess I, I, you know, I don't want to offend the tweeters in this room. Okay, so great. I've uh, attacked you for worshiping executors. Uh, now I'm going to attack the premise of your book. Great. Okay. Uh, my brother is a history professor, or history teacher, uh -huh. and he's like always trying to convince me that there are like uh, really key individuals in mm -hmm. human history and that they set the course of it. Uh, and I reply, of course, I don't have to tell you this, as an economist, no, no, that's not true, it's relative prices that <laughs> determine everything. Uh, and his view is kind of like the great man uh, theory. Theory, yeah. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, so for everyone who's not familiar with it, you can go to Wikipedia, which I did this afternoon to look up exactly how you would describe the great man theory. Uh, and so let's first establish this 19th century, so it's man, it should probably, uh, in modern times we should not say that. Uh, a great person theory is a 19th century idea according to which history can be largely explained by the impact of great people or heroes, highly influential and unique individuals who due to their natural attributes, such as superior intellect, heroic courage, or divine inspiration, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, have a decisive historical effect. Uh, an alternative view, and here's a quote from Herbert Spencer, is you must admit that the genesis of a great man depends on the long series of complex influences which has produced the race in which he appears and the social state into which that race has slowly grown. Uh, before he can remake his society, his society must make him. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm just going to give you some numbers, and then mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to defend the uh, okay. great man theory that you're so articulate or so avidly subscribed to. Okay. Uh, the cost of producing a megawatt hour of wind in 1991 was 191 dollars. Uh, in 1995, it was 128. Uh, in 2000, it was 80. In 2010, oh, so we have an interrupted time series. Goes up to. <laughs> Well, we'll say we'll stick with 2005 with 70, and the estimate now is maybe 56 dollars. Uh, Current 56. That's what uh, our Cracker Jack research assistants here at the University of Chicago pulled out of <laughs> this very afternoon. If you just want to dispute it, I think they're in this room, and we can talk to them later. Uh, I, I just want to point out that Michael Skelly was offering to sell wind power for 18 dollars a megawatt hour. Um, by the end of the book, which is a pretty stunningly low price. Okay, so let's, rather than sell them out here, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's just say it went down. It did. A great yeah. deal. Uh, and let's not argue needlessly about particular numbers and just say, Michael Skelly, who cares? Like, it's just the wind price. He was just a product of those wind prices. And by the way, do, yeah. I, do we care if Michael Skelly succeeded or do we care that the wind got out? And what happened to his project? Oh, look. So there, that's a lot loaded. Without that was like two or three questions. No, no, no. That's a, it's, it's, it's actually a very good and fair question. And here's how I'd answer this. We can build wind farms. We have been building wind farms in this country for modern wind farms, yeah. I would argue, since about 2000. Right? That's when we sort of got rid of the old lattice tower um, contraptions and, and we brought in uh, more of the Danish modern wind, wind turbines. Um, we can build lots of them. But if we don't Think about changing transmission. Right now, about 10% of the electricity in this country comes from the wind. Um, 
if we don't change anything with transmission, I don't know what we'll get to, 15, 20, 25 percent, but there's going to be a cap eventually. Um, because you can build all the wind farms you want in the Oklahoma City, excuse me, the Oklahoma Panhandle, not Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma Panhandle. But if you can't move that wind somewhere, what's the point? No one around there needs it. There's very little demand. You know, you can build multiple nuclear power plant size wind farms out there, and they'll just sit there. It would drive down prices. Um, so I would say that it really did take uh, one or two people, uh, Skelly being one of them, to press this idea and to say what we need in this country are big transmission lines. He wasn't the first person to say it, but he was the first person to come out and say, I'm going to test this theory. I'm going to see if one can be built. I'm going to get the money to do it. Um, so look, I agree with you. If it hadn't been for um, the, the, the Danes making, realizing that a wind turbine shouldn't be this high tech thing, what it really needed to be was durable and survive so it didn't break down every couple weeks. Um, you know, if it hadn't been uh, for any number of changes, there would be no big transmission play. But somebody had to say, let's test this theory. Let's go out there and see if we can build it because somebody had to stick their neck out um, and get it lopped off. So perfect example, 20 years ago, um, there was this guy who said, you know what, let's put some offshore wind turbines off the Cape uh, in Massachusetts. And they had this idea, Cape Wind. And he spent 20 years winning every regulatory and legal fight. And every time he would win a battle, someone else would come up and, and, and attack him. And after 20 years, finally gave up. And what happened? Did the idea go away? No. People learned from it. And now we have the beginnings of a very robust offshore wind industry in, in the United States, partially because people learned from, from Cape Wind what Cape Wind got wrong, um, the technology advance. So here's, this is a story about somebody who stuck their neck out um, and, you know, in my opinion, made a, made a big difference. And also, w in my mind, is very much an inspiration. We have a huge challenge ahead of us uh, in the United States and in the world about how to develop the technology, how to find the financing, how to change the political and regulatory structure. There's going to be dozens of skellies. Uh, but what I can tell you, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, is that I wanted to convey how exciting, challenging, frustrating, depressing, um, exhilarating, all in the span of a week, doing this kind of work could be. Uh, because it, it really was something, you know, it, it, it's a really, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating time, the energy world is changing, and to be out there doing that work uh, is very rewarding. Okay, now one thing, I, for those who haven't been fortunate enough to read the book, I don't, I think we skipped over, did, did he succeed? Well, that depends on what your definition of success <laughs> is. Um, did he succeed? The company he created, Clean Line, um, no longer exists. The main project that I uh, focused on, and spent a couple of years following people around and understanding which was going to be the 700 mile line from the Oklahoma Panhandle to Memphis, uh, does not look like it's going to get built. But um, he had several major legal victories. Um, and one of the other projects he worked on, from Kansas up to uh, the uh, Illinois Indiana border, uh, was sold to a, a local company here in Vanergy. And that looks like it is going to be built. So was he personally successful? No. Was he successful in pushing the idea to see it, if it could be done? Yeah, I think he was. So actually, I think he's an incredibly fascinating person, and I completely understand why he wrote the book. So I'm not, even though I'm trying to give you a hard time, I'm not trying to attack that. But like, the, I kind of wonder, just to push a little bit further, if it really isn't that these are the societal forces. And he was just a product of that because uh, you and uh, not the main character in the book, but uh, and I'm going to blow the guy's name who put together all the acreage in Oklahoma, Beeman. Oh, uh, yeah, Carl Beeman. Yeah. So let's just take he put together the, the land parcels where the uh, uh, he was a great character. Okay. He was so Carl Beeman is this fascinating guy, former Exxon um, 
uh, I think it was a production engineer, work, like he just- With his time, it was like 70, right? I think it was 80 at 80, the time yeah. when he started. And yeah. he, so he, he lived in Amarillo and had, I guess, a house up in Guymon. I think actually he had kind of a girlfriend up in Guymon and he would drive up I wondered up there. about that in the book. Like, yeah, he was a little cagey about yeah. that, but so he you had said this. He grew, you said he grew tomatoes in Well, Oklahoma, yeah, that right. wasn't a euphemism. <laughs> he actually would grow tomatoes, but here was the giveaway. He grew, uh, so he, he grew up in the Oklahoma Pando. He was actually, um, his family was one of the, you know, survivors of the Dust Bowl, mm. um, and he had this, you know, this family plot of land and had this beautiful garden and grew dill. And I remember thinking, how much dill does an 80-year-old man need? And he said, well, I, I take it into town. There's some ladies there who really like it. And that's, he kind of gave me an idea. Maybe there was a girlfriend. But anyway, he would travel up to Guymon, and would, one day he was driving and saw these wind farms. This was a couple of, uh, of turbines being, being installed, and thought to himself, well, if there's good enough wind right here, I mean, I could just build tons of them up in, in the Oklahoma Pandemil. So he goes up, and he know you know, when you have last name Beeman, everyone around there knew who he was, and he would drive around uh, to all his neighbors, and he amassed, I forget what, like 350,000 acres of land yeah. to build wind farms on. Um, but he had the same idea, right? He had this idea, like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And so he, he thought, well, I'll just go to the local uh, grid operator, and surely they'll see the wisdom in this and realized you know, they were not interested in it, all, in it at all. Which is why I suspect, so he passed away earlier this year actually. Mm. Um, he had just got, he was a, a big game hunter. He had just gotten back like 85 years old from hunting in Africa. Uh, and like everyone I talked to said he was doing great and then just one day he was dead. So he, you know, mm. that's, I hope I go like that too. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, he, I think he would have given up on the idea because what's the good of having 350,000 acres? There's nowhere to take the electricity. Uh, but then he met Skelly and thought, oh, you know, this guy's got the right idea. And so he threw his lot in with Skelly. So, but I took it quite optimistic. Michael Skelly didn't take this guy's uh, wind energy to market, but the wind energy actually did make it to market. And that's where, and so that's where I, and I'll stop now, yeah. pushing that it's the societal forces. Well, but now, but, but, the, but the wind energy um, that he, the, the, what Carl Beeman did when he got all those acres together, they still haven't built that wind farm. So they're still waiting for the, the connection uh, to be made until, you know, once again, if you like renewables, you gotta love transmission. Until they build that transmission line in, who's gonna put in, you know, a couple hundred million dollars to build a big wind farm? You know, you just have a bunch of nice turbines sitting out there which spin and do nothing. Okay. Uh, I think you made a good, wise choice with your book. <laughs> uh, okay, so now another theme, uh, I think, in the book, which I'm gonna call like the good old days, mm -hmm. uh, is that in the good old days in America, when America was America, and we were robust, we used to be able to do stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and now we can't really do stuff anymore. It certainly is that feels true, and is that, maybe it's good that we can't do stuff. Like, there's probably a lot of people whose houses are currently where interstate highways are and things like that. Is that, did, did we not take proper account of them or have we really ossified? Those would be maybe the two viewpoints. I, if we didn't have an interstate highway system, would we be able to drive from Chicago to New York? Sure. We were able to drive back then, but if you can build infrastructure, and, and I'm sure, I have not studied the construction of the interstate highway system and how difficult it was. And I fully acknowledge that there were a number of uh, communities that were gravely impacted. Um, in fact, we're still tearing down a lot of these uh, interstates that go through our cities that sort of divided communities. Yep. Um, mistakes were absolutely made. But when you build infrastructure like that, big projects, you never quite know how it's going to impact the world. Um, surely back in 1950s when Dwight Eisenhower said, hey, let's build a big interstate system for national defense purposes, he was not envisioning that that would enable Amazon to do one day delivery of all the stuff that we may or may not need, uh, but yet. Or suburbanization. Or suburbanization. And people commuting and things um, like that. Absolutely, and there's a lot of energy impact of that. Um, but, you know, what Skelly's vision was, um, was 
kind of like the interstate system. A, a new grid, you know, what we have right now, we have all these lovely two-lane roads that connect all the grids. You can get from here to there, but you're gonna go through a lot of stop signs, there's gonna be a lot of congestion. Uh, once you build the interstate system, you can go from Miami to Seattle without stopping. Yeah, maybe, maybe not humanly possible, no. but there are no stop signs. Uh, and, you know, his vision was let's create a, an electronic highway, a highway for electrons that's like that. That, that, that can move bulk power around in that manner, a new backbone of a grid. Um, and, you know, it's not just Skelly. I mean, there were, there were folks, there have been folks at the National Renewable Energy Lab that mm -hmm. have done these studies, that it, the models all suggest that we can get, like I said, we're at 10% wind right now, we throw in, um, you know, maybe 20, 22% when you put in hydro and solar, we can easily get to, uh, 70, 80 percent renewable energy uh, without raising prices if we can build a transmission grid like that. And uh, but do we want to? Do uh, your and book can is, we? Your, so your book is filled with like fascinating vignettes about the hurdles he faced. Do you mm -hmm. want to share some of them? Like a senator bought a house in Nantucket. <laughs> uh, there well, was a 1930s thing from Arkansas that oh my goodness, the, somehow yeah, so, got in the way of like uh, well, the future. Absolutely. So he wants to build, so let's take Arkansas first. He wants to, you know, that if you're going to go, if you're going to no, build you, a transmission you just line. just know my, my wife is from Arkansas. So. Fair enough. What part? Uh, she, well, she's, uh, her, I guess, Little Rock, but really Camden. Okay. Um, this would have gone north. Um, so if you want to build a transmission line from Oklahoma to Tennessee, you're gonna go through Arkansas. There's just no two ways about it. So he goes in and applies to, uh, with the, the state PUC to build this line, and as it turns out, back in the days of the Arkansas Power and Light, now Entergy, that they had basically made a deal, and this is a deal you see replicated all across the, the states. We'll give Arkansas Power and Light a monopoly um, and to, to provide service, so you can, you know, which enabled them to go to Wall Street and get lots of low interest loans because they had a monopoly. But and, and they sort of built this moat around Entergy. And it said, um, you can't build, you can build electrical infrastructure uh, if you have customers in the state. But you can't get customers unless you have got some sort of electrical infrastructure. It was a complete catch-22. And no one had ever thought to change the law. The law had created this monopoly and then essentially pulled the, uh, pulled the, uh, the drawbridge up. And there was no way through. Legally, there was really nothing for him to do. So he ended up having to give up. And there was to no money, Rock. though. Like, why was there no money that could solve the problem? I suppose you could. Well, because the the law was very clear, and then the Public Utility Commission would just said, "We, you know, are well, we don't particularly want to help you, but our hands are tied." Hmm. Um, the bigger hurdle, because he was able to get around that this federal law, but the bigger hurdle, you you, you alluded to a, a, a senator. Um, so Lamar Alexander retiring Tennessee senator. Uh, widely revered in energy land. Why is he revered? Widely revered in widely energy revered, land. Widely revered. Big proponent of nuclear power. Um, so he, uh, back in the day, he ran for president and that didn't work out and then he bought himself a nice little house on Cape Cod. So he got right in the middle of this offshore wind um, fight, the fight against offshore wind. Didn't want to have to look at uh, uh, the turbines. Uh, and he bought the house like a week or two before this project was announced. The timing was really quite something. He does not like to look at wind turbines. You know, he was from Knoxville, Tennessee. That's where most of his family was. And there had been a couple of, uh, literally just two or three wind turbines put up on a ridge above Knoxville. Hated the looks of that. Um, did not want to see turbines. Did not like wind. Had this, used to bring people into his office. In the middle of his office, he had a, a photo of the University of Tennessee football stadium. And he had superimposed or added a turbine in the middle of it to sort of show people how big it was. Uh, and it was one uh, person who was gonna serve on the TVA board and going in and making the round. He said, the only thing I remember meeting Senator Alexander was he just showed me this big picture and let me know how much he disliked uh, this whole idea and how I would never build any wind anywhere near uh, Tennessee. And Lamar Alexander made it very, very clear that he did not want the Tennessee Valley Authority, this federal agency, doing anything or having anything to do with this project. Uh, and even when Skelly and Clean Line were offering this incredible 
bargain basement price, $18.50 per megawatt hour uh, for the first year. And it'll go up to 2% 2, 2 a year, end up at about $30. Still a very, very compelling price. He made it really clear he did not like that and did not want that. He preferred nuclear power plants because they generated jobs um, for the community. And you know, for him, uh, energy was all about creating jobs. Hmm. Uh, and you know, I, I personally have a fundamental disagreement with about that. I think energy is about, uh, if you're talking about electricity, you want it clean, you want it reliable, uh, 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 safe, uh, affordable. That generates economic development. Uh, I, I just, I find it very incomprehensible to sort of say, no, we're gonna generate, you know, it doesn't matter the price, we're using it to generate a lot of jobs. But that's how Lamar Alexander thought. Um, and you know, there's sometimes I, I want to sort of, you know, jump up and down and scream and say, you know, don't, people talk about wanting renewable energy in this country. And there was a project that was going to deliver four gigawatts of wind power, which is an enormous amount. It's two nuclear power plants at a price that was lower than most gold, excuse me, most gas, most coal, nuclear, uh, and it was stopped over what, by one senator? I mean, so going back to your question before, can we still build big things? I'm not sure. Hmm. I mean, since when did we give a single US senator the power to stop a multi-billion dollar project? Oh, well, wait, we don't think that happened 80 years ago? Uh, you know, it must have, but it just seems frustrating. I mean, I agree. hundreds yeah. of people worked on this, uh, yeah, it wasn't as if Skelly was saying, hey, I want the people of Tennessee to pay these exorbitant prices for wind, uh, because wind is yeah. somehow good. No, he was saying, well, I want people to, to, this is, you can phase out some of your coal, you can lower your prices. Um, you know, it's interesting, after all this happened and went down, and all the details started coming out, Memphis, Memphis Power and Water is now talking about breaking free from the Tennessee Valley Authority, emancipating themselves because they're tired of the way the Tennessee Valley Authority is, um, you know, making them pay actually prices that they don't need to pay. You know, yeah. it's cord cutting, right? Yeah. You know, we're all tired of paying yeah. the high prices for, 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 for television. So, you know, cut the cord, go with the new technology. Uh, you have a great line in the book that uh, I think the CEO of the TVA is, was simultaneously uh, purchasing two private airplanes or something for the... Yes. TVA yes. and didn't want to be investigated or something. So, yeah, didn't want didn't want the uh, any extra scrutiny. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, so you know that the, the 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 former head of the TVA uh, then retired, and I guess because he's a glutton for punishment, took the new job of running PG&E out in California. Oh. So, <laughs> Whoa. he's right in the middle of the uh, wildfires and. Uh, um, okay. You know, Skelly likes a challenge. I guess yeah. uh, Bill Johnson likes a challenge yeah, yeah. too. It's definitely a, a reclamation project. Okay, I think we have about two minutes before people start to ask questions. But uh, I guess are there broader lessons that are lurking here? So I'll just you know we got m much motivation in energy land, but uh, we've got the climate challenge. We've got the Green New Deal. Uh, we've got the IPCC's statement that 2030 has a very particular meaning. Uh, we have a one and a half degree C yeah. goal. Like, how do you put all that witch's brew in the middle of the table and like, <laughs> yeah, what are you, what are, uh, what, what well, are you gonna a, do with that? That's an easy one. Yeah, um, yeah. And like, how, sh and how are you seeing the election? Or are the people running <laughs> in the face of that? Um, I'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, Cause I think the current president doesn't really like uh, wind turbines either. No, no, current president. Something about birds or uh, Well, no, I, the, the big problem that he has is that he seems to think that when the wind stops running, he can't watch television anymore, which is a big deal for, 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 for President Trump. Um, and I'm not making that up. He said that a number of times. People always focus on the birds and the cancer. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, to me, I think the real key is that, it, you know, honey, I can't watch yeah. TV. Yeah. The wind stopped blowing. Um, look, I. Here's how I think about climate change and, and, and the bigger lessons. And that is that, you know, we talk about one and a half degrees, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. There's a huge difference between a one and a two degree temperature rise. And there's a huge difference between a two and a three degree and three and four degrees. It gets progressively worse. We need to be doing and deploying lots of different ideas to tackle this. There's no one good idea. 
you know, Skelly had a good idea, transmission. It's not gonna solve everything. It doesn't do anything about um, agriculture. You know, there are all sorts of different issues. But we need to be trying a lot of different things. And we need to not be afraid of them. And we need to make sure that if there's a good idea, it gets a good hearing. And I think if there's one lesson to be drawn from this book is that why didn't what clearly, to me at least, is a good idea? Let's build transmission. Let's move bulk power around. Let's build an interstate system for electrons. Why didn't that get a good hearing? Why was it ended up being, you know, sort of stuffed in, in a senator's pocket and disposed of by a federal agency that to this day that did not want to turn over its deliberations of why it said no to this? Um, that does not seem to be a very healthy way of approaching the big challenges we have ahead. I'm not saying we should have built this. There are actually decent reasons you can make an argument why not to build this. Impact on landowners um, would be first and foremost. But let's have that discussion. Let's not be afraid of that discussion. I think we're afraid of having some of this discussion. And let's acknowledge that whether or not I eat an impossible burger or a hamburger is not going to by itself change climate. The, the, the challenge ahead is one of infrastructure. It's one of big changes and big investments. And when somebody comes along, whether it's Skelly, whether it's somebody else, with a big idea, let's embrace that. Let's look at it and say, does this make sense? Is this something we should do? Now, to get to your question about the presidential campaign, I have no idea what's going on. I think there's a debate tonight. I mean, people, so Jay Inslee, the senator, uh, yeah. excuse me, the uh, governor of, of Washington, um, the former he, candidate for president. Former candidate, thank you. Former Democratic candidate yeah. for president. He loved transmission. He put it in, I mean, it was, you know, everyone gives Jay Inslee credit for having an actual detailed plan. Transmission was a big part of that. Uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, a number of people have actually come out and said uh, that they like transmission. Uh, the problem is President Obama liked transmission. Um, you know, I've got a, a, a scene in the book where before he gets, um, before his inauguration, the economy is melting down, the, the beginning of the Great Recession, they're looking, um, him and his several key advisors meeting here in Chicago are looking at ideas, how do we stimulate the economy? And one of the ideas was, let's build transmission. And it was shelled because it, it was gonna take too long. It wasn't, you know, if, if the purpose was to stimulate. It wasn't shovel ready. It wasn't shovel ready, right. It would take several years, it would take lawsuits, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it, it personally, who am I looking for as a candidate? Democrat, Republican. Um, Somebody who's willing to, to, we're in an era where we need some, uh, some big ideas and some, some big uh, solutions. And I would like to see somebody who's willing to, to roll up his or her sleeve uh, and, and to tackle some of that. Terrific. Uh, 